Hey, we're in the street questions with Tammy Hobson. There we go. Here we go. Uh, I'm so blessed to have Tammy on the podcast. She actually reached out to me on LinkedIn. We just had like a long conversation. We didn't know each other before, but now we kind of know each other. And she let me kind of vent to her about some stuff I don't like on the internet. <laughs> Which is awesome, right? And I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's going to be a surprise. Right? Tammy knows. <laughs> you just though. hooked him. Yeah, exactly. Well, maybe I will tell you. Maybe if you listen to the end of the podcast, right? So, no, Tammy, Tammy, uh, we, Tammy and I were talking. And so I, I just really love meeting people in education that I don't know who I've connected with. And I, I can see her doing really amazing work. And Tammy has actually been in education 20 plus years. Um, she's done everything from teacher, vice principal, principal. Um, she worked at the central office level. A lot of similarities to kind of um, the work I've done over the years. And now she she does different work with different organizations, working on her own. So it is uh, it's been really awesome to meet you. And I, and also a little on the personal side, we're both uh, runners. You were actually a good runner at one point. I've always been a terrible runner, right? But you were doing sprinting, and and now you're doing some uh, you're doing a half marathon. T can, before I get into the three questions. Tell me like about the running journey. How, how is this? Do yeah. you like it? I would not call myself a runner, <laughs> but right. I do run um, yeah. occasionally. No, actually, my first love right now is horseback riding. So I've always had a need for speed. So I was a sprinter and a jumper and I would throw stuff. So I was a multi-event <laughs> athlete, right. um, you know, javelin shot put, all of that. Um, but as an adult, you don't really have too many areas where you can go do hurdles with someone or throw the disc. <laughs> So, right. You know, socially it's awkward. Um, so the endurance opportunity allowed me to still have fun with competition um, while also staying healthy and meeting people and making connections. So I do enjoy running, um, but I also enjoy a little bit of running so I can ride horses more, hike more, ride my bike more, things like that. <laughs> you know, you said something that was like kind of interesting and made me think about it. You're like, I'm not really a runner. And I, I always say I'm not really a runner, but I run races all the time. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, I run races, but I suck at it, but I still do it. And it's like, kind of like, it's your out. Like if you say you're a runner, then if people are expecting you to be really good at it, I'm like, nah, I'm not a runner. I just kind of do it. But I, it is like, I like, uh, it's funny because I am like, I just want to, you know, I want to run for myself and, yeah. you know, I just want to get better. And then I get in a race and someone's ahead of me. I'm like, oh, I gotta, I gotta crush that person. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I would say I'm an athlete. That's me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you have the competitive spirit, but I'm, I definitely do more than just running. So I think, but it is funny how yeah. it like, when you call it an identity versus something you do, yeah. how you approach it. Yeah, like it is, it mm -hmm. is a very, you know, I, I try not to be competitive, but I feel like I just need that little push. And it's not like I hate the person after, it's just jeering. <laughs> I think that's them. great. Yeah. You that know, person's actually helping you to become better with that competitive spirit. So, yeah. And then if they're way ahead of me, I'm like, yeah, I'm just a runner. <laughs> I just do this on the side. <laughs> You're like, you go. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not really into this. So, okay, so Tammy, uh, you've done a ton of different roles. I know you've had some inspiring teachers. You've worked with some great educators over mm -hmm. the year. I know you're working with some great teachers right now. So when you think of a really great teacher, who's someone you think of and why? So I have a long answer and a short answer to this, or response. I'll go with the short one, but I'll tell you why I struggled. Um, so I'm an inquiry-based learner, and I think by way of question before I think by way of response. So the word teacher made me think, what does it mean to teach? And it just made me um, wonder if we had the same definition of that. So that was kind of my first, I went down that really far. That road Don't make really me far. define it. Don't make me define it. I don't yeah, okay. Let me Google this real quick. Um, but then I, my more succinct short answer um, came about, actually, I was listening to the podcast this morning because um, I was building up my writing this level to be a guest. Um, and you guys were, you and Allison were speaking about cultivating talent. And, it, and in that, you talked about how she changed the word from build capacity to access and then how words are important. And then it, it just made me remember um, a woman named Deborah Powers. I co-taught with her. I was a fifth grade general education teacher. She was a special education teacher. This is a long time ago. Mm. Um, but she taught me the power of words. So that listening to that podcast helped me think of that, which helped me think of her. Um, and Deborah Powers, which the thing that to this day I remember and I use is um, she came back from a special education conference and is a person who was always trying to pull out students thinking I would ask the question, oh, why did you say that? You know, in polite tone and all of that and didn't realize I was actually closing the door on, on a number of kiddos. Mm. And she said, just switch it to what makes you say that. And of course, mm. keep that positive tone. Right. And it allowed the kids not to, I didn't understand that the word why could create defensiveness and or shutting of the door because they might be internalizing, oh, did I get it wrong? Or did I say something not the way, you know, that um, wasn't the response. 
Um, so what makes you say that? It changed. Just that one question and switching words changed the emotional environment in our classroom. So that made me think then, well, what else did Devra, um, how did she inspire me? And there are two main things. I see her as a door opener. And then we, she's probably one of the first people that I really learned how to act with synergy and found the power in that. So what I mean by door opener is just that example I shared about word choice. Um, she also was passionate about the, the our kiddos, because they were our kiddos, mm. who happened to be on her caseload, got to have the richest learning experiences every day. So she was an advocate for pushing in and tier, them being um, in tier one instruction. And I was blessed to be that teacher that got to experience that the first time with her. And then every year thereafter that I was at that school, we would go to the principal and advocate to stay together. And we got to my whole time in that building. We were together. Um, and the door opener, she, for a number of ways to include, this goes into the act with synergy. If I was in a mini lesson before we jumped into our small groups, if I was um, helping the students with a certain topic, um, and I could see on their faces it wasn't landing, I would transparently say to her, you know, Miss Powers, can you help me? I, I don't think I'm explaining it quite well. And she would do it. And our, if we got to the place where I could just look at her and she, or she could look at the kids and be like, oh man, Tammy's losing them. <laughs> Let me pick up where she <laughs> left off. Um, and so that acting with synergy, just, we learned each other's strengths. And we also understood um, where we still were learning and how we could leverage that and model that for students, but at the same time, capitalize on, you know, I'll step in here, you step in there. And it got to be that place where you kind of had your solos, but you sang the chorus together right. um, and our kids truly benefited from it. And so to see that impact allowed me to really believe in the co-teaching model, but um, most important, not most importantly, equally as important, um, Denver Powers, this is such a humble woman um, who's just was amazing at model, modeling what it meant to be a great teacher right. and to be student centered and student first. Deborah Powers, oh, shout out! There you go. I love it. So the that we're, we were talking about this before we got on the podcast. I think one of the best things about asking questions and um, is really kind of putting the onus on the people you serve to figure out their own pathway. And right. even even when I was a principal, and we were talking about this a little bit before. Because I know you're a principal as well. Uh, mm -hmm. When students would mess up, they'd be sent to the office. And basically, all I did was ask them questions. Say, hey, like, why are you here? Like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Right? And mm -hmm. like, and then I'd say, okay, now that you've told me, like, what would you do if you were me? And basically, the, the premise was, too often when we talk, they're not focused on what happened. They're focused on, I don't like you. Like, you're, you're a jerk for right. bringing this up. But when you get them to talk, they start focusing on what they did, kind of going through that mm -hmm. process. And then... When I say, okay, what would you do if you're me? You're like, hey, how do I make this right? Like, how do I kind of figure this out? And so you're doing that not only just for that moment, but for them in the future. Like, hey, when I screw up, how do I take ownership over it? And how do I fix it? And that's what, mm -hmm. that was the whole process of it too. It wasn't about just what happened in the moment. It's setting them up for when they make mistakes, which we all do, that how would they actually deal with in the future? And it was really through that asking of questions. So I love that mm -hmm. focus. Now I'm like, now I'm like going over, I'm like, oh, what words should I have changed in the sentences? But yeah. I have to like, go look at that again now, kind of, you know, like kind of flip it on the positive side there. So uh, speaking about administration, I know you've mm -hmm. been an administrator. I know um, you have a big focus on facilitative leadership. We're going to talk about that in the next podcast, the longer version of this. But like, okay. what do you think of the great administrators you've worked with? You know, maybe you had as a student, who's someone you think of and why? Um, Robin Morgan. So I can't wait for uh, my fifth grade former colleagues and um, teacher colleagues and lifelong friends, um, because I actually sent them a text when you sent that message. I said, my answer is Robin Morgan. What would you guys say about her? And it's still the same for all of us. Um, so I'm reading the book that you and Allison have recently um, written, yeah. What Makes a Great Leader and, or Principal. Um, I actually substitute that with leader all the time in my head, yeah. but um, I, and so I'm hyper connecting to it. Like it's just my brain can't stop doing that. So for, for me, the things that make Robin the most inspirational principal for me or administrator is um, she's a talent cultivator, a visionary, and a continuous learner. And the continuous learner is probably the thing that stands out the most for me. And that's what I then took into my role as a principal. Um, but one, I'll kind of go backwards and then I'll talk, speak a little bit more about her. But the la one of the last ways that she truly inspired me was to help me to take the leap into administration because I was in a different building at the time um, and the principal and assistant principal there encouraged me to, to look into 
going down the administrator road and going back and getting my master's in administration and supervision. And I hesitated because I'm like, man, that's going to take me further away from the classroom. I love instruction. It's a common story. I know. But part of that program, you would go and you would interview people, you know, as you're going through the program. And so I went back and interviewed Robin Morgan and I was transparent and I'm like, they want me to do this and I can see how it will open doors in the future, but I'm really struggling because she knew how much I love teaching in the classroom, et cetera. And she said, Tammy, I had the same story. I was a kindergarten teacher. I had someone saw something in me, et cetera. And she's like, but I realized that my classroom just got bigger. And I was like, your classroom got bigger. And it's so true because then I reflected when I was a teacher in the elementary school where she was the principal. And that's exactly right. She modeled continuous learning, but she also created the conditions for us to be continuous learners and to um, teach each other. So we were truly um, in a space where we could cultivate talent. So for example, if there was the, um, something, I'll, I'll be generic for the sake of time, but like a literacy focus of the six grade levels in our elementary school, K through five, we would have by grade level, different areas where we, we were becoming subject matter experts. Um, in this overall literacy space, but we were diving into the major parts. And then we were positioned to teach each other, but we were also positioned in our team time um, to re really go deeply so that we could be the subject matter experts, so we could be of benefit to the other grade levels. Um, and that is, I grew tremendously. Our kids grew <laughs> tremendously. Um, and then when she left that fifth grade team, we became so tight because we, that collective efficacy was so high level that we only made it one more year without her because we were like, this is how we're supposed to function. Um, and we all actually went our separate ways after that, but she made us a unit um, by grade level and by the whole school. So very inspirational moment. All right, give her a little shout out there. Thank you. One of the best things that happened to me was I remember getting a teaching job and uh, they said, can you teach math? I said, I could teach grade seven math, but like after that, like I couldn't do grade eight math. Right. And then <laughs> they're like, okay, we won't do that. And then the next year they get me teaching grade nine math. I was like, oh, like now, what am I going to do now? That's I can't hilarious. Read, right? And so they did it. And it was interesting because I actually grade nine is where I like, whew, I just dropped off in math. So I kind of had this in my head that I couldn't teach it. Cause like I was a terrible student at the same grade level. And it was interesting because I didn't really understand what I was about to teach. So I had to like go through it and learn it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as I was going through the process, it really helped me to understand where kids would struggle. Cause I was actually going through the struggle real time. And then I was like, oh yeah, I know why you did that. Cause I did the same thing. And here's, and that was like yes. one of the best experiences for me was to kind of like figure out how to learn on my own so I could mm -hmm. teach effectively. So it's kind of, you know, doing that because a lot of times when we teach, we forget about learning all of a sudden that we're just transferring, but you have to remember what it is to mm -hmm. be in that learning position. So speaking of learning, last yes. question, um, you go back, you look at your career, you've not only got to work at so many different levels in education, but you get to see schools all around North America. So there's a lot that you're learning. And so from those mm -hmm. experiences, if you can go back to your very first year of teaching, what advice would you give to yourself and why? My very first year of teaching, um, I will count the long-term substitute role that I had prior to going to that whole first year. Um, and it was that the greatest lessons you will learn will be from your students. However, continuously um, developing yourself and your in your learning will, will build your readiness level to accept the students. So for example, I was that teacher. I was diehard. That was my identity. I was the one at Barnes and Noble with all, all the books around me on the floor and on the weekend and just diving into them. Um, and I, I read and I applied and it was, it was great. I, my kids benefited from it. However, I was so entrenched in it that I would struggle at times when, um, what the book said was going to happen didn't happen. <laughs> I was like, wait a second, this does not translate. What am I doing wrong or whatever it may be. And what I learned over time is that the books would offer me possible strategies and approaches that were very valuable. But the, at the tactical level, the what I was doing to really deploy that how or go after that, you know, to get that strategy up and running needed to be very personalized and kid specific. And um, when I was a long term sub, I started um, after a teacher who was really sick and she had to take a leave and the teacher um, really struggled with classroom management. She was just really, really sick. Mm -hmm. um, and so the kids were running the classroom when I got there. And this one student was the leader of running the classroom, um, really bristled against me um, 
it was a way to, you know, hold her ground. And so I was trying to make sure that privately I would work with her to redirect her and then publicly praise her. And it just got worse and worse. I was like, what am I doing wrong? And I learned, but I was like, that's what the book says to do. And it's working right. for every other child. Right. But what I learned is um, the public publicly praising her was where I was going wrong at the tact at that what level at the right. tactical level. So I started to then privately praise her. I privately would redirect her, you know, save face. I would never do that right. publicly, but then privately I would just put a sticky note and it would be an authentic praise, nothing that was fake or fluffy, a real authentic praise. And first from some observational data, I put it, this is back when desks had the shelf system and I would just tuck it in her desk. So only she could see it in the morning. And I would see the smile. She'd be looking down, but I'd see the cheeks and the smile. I'm like, okay, there we go. We got a little win. Um, and then as soon as she looked up, it was, you know, this type of face. Um, but over time, that those public moments or private moments were um, embraced as public moments for her. And we could get there together. So what I read in being a continuous learner and learning from my peers only um, continued to raise, raise my readiness level. So firm believer in still doing that but also really lean into your students are going to give you the biggest lesson that they, that you'll ever learn time and time again, as administrator, your teachers and your families and your students, your community. And in this role as a facilitator and coach and consultant, um, anybody that you partner with to include, you know, on those podcasts today, I already learned a lot from you. So just that, that openness of the greatest le lessons are going to be from the people that you're with. This is the embodiment of the innovator's mindset. And when I speak to groups, one of the things I always say is, look, I, I don't know your kids. I don't know your community. I don't know any of this stuff. So I'm just sharing some ideas with you. Ultimately, you got to figure out the solution. So mm -hmm. you can say, hey, that's all awesome. But I, I this wouldn't work. Here's what I would change doing that process. Yes. Because I don't know your kids, right? And so I think a lot of times when we like, Hey, this strategy works for like 90% of kids. My first question is, well, what about the other 10%? What are you doing for them? Because mm -hmm. something, you know, something's not clicking. And it's not saying, well, none of this works. It's doing what you did saying like, Hey, there's an element of this works, but this element is actually making things worse. So I'm going to change this. So that's mm -hmm. that, that focus on innovation. That that's to me, what innovation is, is actually doing things that, you know, and kind of building on it to make it better for the kids you serve. That's the best way to do it. So I loved it. Yeah, I mean, this is awesome connecting with you. I'm looking forward to, and I'm going to actually put you on the spot right now. So I was expecting this, by the way. Make sure you connect with Tammy at her new website, TammyHobson.com. Oh, I haven't made that yet. Yeah, <laughs> but I have but another website. But by, <laughs> but by the time, we'll link to the other website, but by the time this is published, it should be something there. So I put you on the Fair. spot. I do appreciate that. I like that's, that. That's what we call leading up, right? Putting you in that. So like you got like a month. So yes. this is July. So if it's not there, okay. oh, time. Bring it down. <laughs> One month. <laughs> Talk about this. We're going to see if you follow, you know, my advice. Anyways, thanks everyone for listening. Tammy, thanks so much for being on the podcast. <laughs> we'll see you all soon.